So these two mechanisms involve substitution and elimination. That's already a clue in and of itself, because on the exam, only this much information is given. So with SN1, SN2, E1, E2, we need to look at all of our clues in order to determine the pathway for the reaction. So in question A, I have a cyclohexene derivative with a bromine leaving group and an ethyl group right here. The first thing I notice is that this alkyl halide is secondary. And with this piece of information alone, we can't narrow down whether or not this reaction undergoes elimination or substitution. But if you look at the reagents, we have sodium ethoxide with ethanol as the solvent, and the reaction system is heated. So heat is a catalyst here. So when heat is included in a reaction, elimination is always favored over substitution. Now the question is, is this an E1 or E2 pathway? Well, we have a very strong base here, and the way to determine that is to first estimate the pKa of the conjugate acid. So the conjugate acid of ethoxide is ethanol, which is used as the solvent. And the pKa of ethanol is close to 16. Now generally, this is the criteria for any strong base or strong nucleophile. We need to determine if ethoxide will be substituted on the compound or will act as a strong base and eliminate the compound. So, with the base in question, if we look at its conjugate acid and the pKa of that conjugate acid is 16 or below, elimination is unlikely. In this case, the pKa of our conjugate acid is 16, which means, in general, ethanol is a weak acid. The weaker the conjugate acid, the stronger the conjugate base. Another calculation you can do in your head is 14 minus pKa, which gives you the pKb. Like with pKa's, the lower the pKb, the stronger the base. So in this case, the pKb of ethoxide is close to negative 2. Again, this little analysis is in reference to the conjugate acid strength of the base that we're analyzing. So to find the pKb of ethoxide, or roundabout estimate, we use the pKa of its conjugate acid, ethanol. So having said that, we know sodium ethoxide will likely eliminate the compound and act as a strong base as opposed to a nucleophile. Another clue is that it has a charge. E1 and SN1 reactions involve neutral compounds and neutral solvents. SN2 reactions involve a polar aproduct solvent, and we don't have any of that here. So if you accumulate all of the clues, E2 is the very likely pathway for this reaction. And therefore it's concerted, it's one step. So let's start by drawing our reactant and introduce our strong base, sodium ethoxide. So in E2 reactions, the first movement is the loss of the leaving group. So the electrons between the leaving group and carbon flow back to the leaving group and it's expelled from the compound. In the transition state, you can imagine a partial positive charge that transiently accumulates on this carbon because of the loss of electrons because of the leaving group. Now in order to mediate this in a single concerted step, the ethoxide anion can deprotonate an adjacent hydrogen and form an alkene, which will mitigate this charge. One option is the deprotonation using this hydrogen. So the ethoxide anion plucks off the proton and the electrons flow back into the compound like so. The result is the formation of the Zaitsev alkene, forming a diene compound, and the bromide anion. This is considered the Zaitsev alkene because we have greater substitution. However, it turns out that the Zaitsev alkene in this case is actually the minor product to a great extent because this hydrogen here, or any one of these two hydrogens at this position, are also available to be deprotonated by the ethoxide anion. So we can show that in a separate step. Now similarly, the leaving group is expelled from the compound forming a partial positive in the transition state here. And the ethoxide can come in and deprotonate using hydrogens at this position, the allylic position. So electrons flow from the ethoxide oxygen 
to the proton and the electrons in the carbon hydrogen bond return back into the compound having an overall stabilizing effect. The resultant compound is conjugated and we form the bromide anion which is exactly why the Hoffman product is favored instead of the Zaitsev. Even though theoretically the Zaitsev product is more stable, in a microanalysis of this functional moiety, if you look at the entire molecule, conjugation has an even greater stabilizing effect. And having pi systems that are apart from one another does not contribute to the stability that this compound would because of conjugation. So really, as far as this E2 mechanism goes, this top reaction does not occur, and the Zaitsev alkene is considered the minor product. With these mechanisms, we always want to show the major product, which is the conjugated diene formation in this case. In question B, we're given the cyclopentane derivative with a bromine leaving group and a methyl group directly adjacent. In this case, we're only using methanol. As far as assumptions go, we can assume no heat was applied to the reaction mix. So elimination may not be favored. Also, methanol acts as a very weak base. It's a neutral compound in general. It has a pKa close to 15. So it's very likely substitution will occur, rather SN1 or SN2. We know that SN2 reactions involve very strong nucleophiles. And because of the strength of the nucleophile, the solvent must be aprotic, like acetonitrile or dimethylformamide. In this case, we only have methanol in the solution. So this reaction is actually a solvolysis reaction. Because the weak nucleophile methanol acts as the solvent medium in which the reaction occurs. So because we don't have an aprotic solvent, and we have a secondary alkyl bromide, and because the reaction is solvolysis and we have neutral species, as the medium and as the nucleophile, this reaction proceeds in an SN1 pathway. So, in the first step, the bromine acts as a leaving group and is expelled from the compound. The loss of the leaving group means we form a secondary carbocation at this position. Now we go back to carbocation stability and see that we formed a secondary carbocation directly adjacent to a tertiary carbon. This tertiary carbon possesses a hydrogen. So you guessed it, there's a 1,2 hydride shift which moves the hydrogen to this position and forces the positive charge onto the tertiary carbon, which has a stabilizing effect. Now that we've formed the stabilized carbocation, methanol could come in and nucleophilically attack this position rather from the front or in the back. So electrons flow from the oxygen on methanol to the carbocation, in this case front side attack. Which gives us our charged intermediate. So in this step, methanol acts as a nucleophile, but in the final step, methanol acts as the solvent base which can come in and deprotonate this intermediate to form the ether. So in a typical deprotonation, electrons flow from the methanol oxygen to the proton and the oxygen hydrogen electrons flow back to the oxygen. So the net result of our reaction is that we form the ether group on the tertiary carbon and the ultimate yield of this reaction is racemic. We can form the R and S enantiomer.